Chapter Nineteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Nineteen: Maryland Free the notable military events which occurred in the state of maryland during the last three years of the war connect themselves more with the general history of the union than with the local history of the state and in reviewing the latter political results become the dominant feature the power of rebellion in maryland was effectually broken during the year eighteen sixty one the union party formed and maintained a solid organization and on november sixth in that year elected augustus w bradford governor by a majority of thirty one thousand four hundred and twelve for a term of four years to succeed governor hicks at the same election a legislature was chosen with an overwhelming majority of union members governor bradford was inaugurated on the eighth of january eighteen sixty two and his inaugural message declared in the most outspoken terms against secession and for maintaining the union by a vigorous prosecution of the war next to the question between union and secession the question of emancipation was brought to popular attention in maryland at a very early period we have seen how president lincoln hoped to induce voluntary action on this subject by his plan of compensated abolishment first suggested to her leading politicians and afterwards officially recommended to congress and it was this policy which directly brought about the formation of new party divisions in the state by the census of 1860 the population of maryland was white 515,918 free colored 83,942 slave 87,189 it was therefore slavery traditions rather than money value in slaves which created the strength of pro-slavery sentiment and the political influence of the institution the fact also needs to be noted that the numbers of slaves and free colored persons were nearly equal a condition producing special influences of peculiar power in the anti-slavery movement which the war called into action under such conditions the whole colored population was more intelligent more active and more self-reliant than in dense slave communities and both the desire and the opportunities for escape from bondage were greatly increased amid the confusion of war and the presence of armies it has been elsewhere stated that the president and the local military commanders for a while discouraged or forbade the presence of negro runaways in military camps but this was only a temporary check and was practically discontinued after the first year of the war the army finding more serious work to do than returning fugitive slaves to their masters and it was at length formally prohibited by the act of congress of march thirteenth eighteen sixty two when therefore president lincoln announced his policy of compensated emancipation in the spring of eighteen sixty two maryland unionists who belonged to the conservative or slaveholding class were moved to oppose it not alone by their lifelong hatred of abolition but also by the constant irritation of the escape of their slaves their prejudices blinded them too much to see that this was the exact reason which should have induced them heartily to accept and second it at mr lincoln's first interview with the border state delegations on march tenth eighteen sixty two to propose his policy only two of the maryland representatives were present cornelius l l leary and j w crisfield and they gave him little encouragement 
the reluctance they expressed seemed based more upon pride than economical expediency mr crisfield said he did not think the people of maryland looked upon slavery as a permanent institution and he did not know that they would be very reluctant to give it up if provision was made to meet the loss and they could be rid of the race but they did not like to be coerced into emancipation either by the direct action of the government or by indirection as through the emancipation of slaves in this district of columbia or the confiscation of southern property as now threatened and when assured by the president that no coercive action was contemplated that he had no present design beyond his patriotic appeal to them mr crisfield further said mr president if what you now say could be heard by the people of maryland they would consider your proposition with a much better feeling than i fear without it they will be inclined to do it would appear however that little could be expected from the maryland union representatives at that time in behalf of the president's policy they had been elected on june thirteenth eighteen sixty one by the party organization which still reflected the conservatism existing before the war and whose single bond of party affiliation was opposition to secession and disunion a condition of political sentiment at that time common to all the border slave states and which was formulated by the crittenden resolution none of the maryland representatives had yet become infused with the spirit and independence of the new anti-slavery drift in politics throughout the regular session of congress from december eighteen sixty one to the middle of july eighteen sixty two they were either silent or their votes were recorded against the great anti-slavery measures of that session when after the lapse of four months the president called them to a second interview to hear his renewed appeal in behalf of compensated emancipation they joined the bulk of other border state conservatives in refusing to entertain his policy they pledged themselves anew to the union and the prosecution of the war but urged various reasons why they should have nothing to do with emancipation it was quite natural that the bolder politicians of maryland should seize an opportunity so favorable to begin the organization of a new and more radical party and endeavor to supplant them in popular leadership the question had been brought to the attention of the people of maryland with especial force by the bill pending in congress to emancipate slaves in the district of columbia which was introduced on december sixteenth eighteen sixty one though active discussion of it did not begin till february twenty four the bill passed the senate on april three and the house on april eleven and was signed by the president on april sixteen meanwhile the president had also by his special message of march six recommended his plan of compensated abolishment which congress promptly endorsed public sentiment had at once taken up the question in maryland the first declarations being from conservative opponents of both propositions on the second of january eighteen sixty two the legislature in a series of resolutions expressing confidence in the administration generally and in mr lincoln personally declared that they nevertheless protested against all attempts from whatever quarter to make the present war for the restoration of the union the means of interfering with the domestic institutions of the states again on february twenty two the legislature by another resolution appealed to the northern states to rebuke in an unmistakable manner those of their representatives in congress who are wasting their time in devising schemes for the abolition of slavery in the rebellious states and once more early in march the legislature reaffirmed and commended to congress the language and spirit of the crittenden resolution and declared its apprehension at indications of an interference with the institution of slavery in the slaveholding states though at the same time it reaffirmed its confidence in the wisdom and moderation of the president 
the popular voice was more specific than these legislative generalities a large meeting was held about the first of april in montgomery county which lies contiguous to the district of columbia and which was therefore peculiarly annoyed by the escape of slaves the resolutions denounced the act to emancipate the slaves in the district of columbia as unwise ill-timed and unconstitutional and as the entering wedge of a general scheme of abolition the latter being evidently regarded as the most serious point of the indictment but conservative views like these did not comprise the whole public sentiment of maryland a convention met in the city of baltimore on may twenty eighth eighteen sixty two composed of delegates from union meetings in the various wards which passed a series of resolutions approving president lincoln's policy of compensated abolishment declaring it to the interest of the people of the state especially its slaveholders to accept the pecuniary aid tendered and favoring the inauguration of such a plan of emancipation and colonization as will be equitable to those interested a more practical and local reform was broached in the long preamble and resolution which closed the series setting forth the inequality and injustice of the existing state apportionment through which the southern counties where the slave population was centered containing one-fourth of the population and wealth and paying less than one-fourth of the taxes possessed the virtual control of the whole state sending thirty-four out of the seventy-four delegates and fourteen out of twenty-two senators to the legislature alleging further that under this uh, Portionment, the slave owners of the state constituting fewer than sixteen thousand individuals virtually wielded its political power and that they demanded a change of the state constitution to correct this unequal representation this was certainly a strong argument in favor of holding a state constitutional convention and doubtless played no unimportant part in stimulating the action of liberal and progressive voters among the class of non-slaveholding whites and particularly among the white laboring population of baltimore during the remainder of the year the party reorganization thus begun was powerfully aided first by the union victory at the battle of antietam and the quick expulsion of the confederate invasion second by president lincoln's preliminary proclamation of emancipation which was issued almost immediately thereafter when in due course the final emancipation proclamation of january one eighteen sixty three appeared the policy of the administration on this subject had become so pronounced and unalterable that it was by mere force of circumstances an unavoidable issue in the politics of every state hitherto conservatives already began to show the influence of the profound movement of public opinion which had taken place and francis thomas one of the maryland representatives in congress so far changed his attitude that on january twelfth eighteen sixty three he introduced a resolution which was agreed to that the committee on emancipation and colonization be instructed to inquire into the expediency of making an appropriation to aid the state of maryland in a system of emancipation and colonization of persons of color inhabitants of said state a bill was introduced on the nineteenth by mr bingham of ohio for the same purpose which was referred to a select committee the committee on february twenty five reported a bill appropriating ten millions to aid maryland emancipation but parliamentary objection was immediately interposed and representative chrisfield said that the measure was not asked for by the state of maryland the bill was recommitted and not again reported probably for the reason that the session was almost ended maryland not being ready to accept such a boon congress would not force it upon her as no important election was held in maryland during the year eighteen sixty two political sentiment was not further defined than by the resolutions of the convention which have been mentioned and there being little or no party wreckage to clear away an unusually thorough and radical party 
reorganization took place in eighteen sixty three there was only one of the union state offices to be filled by general election but the contest over the choice of representatives in congress which usually creates a spirited political activity was in this case supplemented by the deeper struggle over the election of a legislature in which the question of state emancipation was the dominant and far-reaching issue and for which public opinion had been fully ripened by the events of eighteen sixty two the party machinery was still in the hands of the state central committee appointed by the union state convention of may twenty three eighteen sixty one which reflected the conservative unionism of the earlier stages of the war but a vehicle for the expression of more advanced and radical thought of maryland voters was found in the organization of the union leagues within the state and by this instrumentality a convention met in baltimore on june sixteenth eighteen sixty three the call for which had addressed itself to all persons who support the whole policy of the government in suppressing the rebellion contemporaneously with this movement the old party organization headed by the state central committee also called a state convention to meet on june twenty three the two bodies being designated respectively the union league convention and the state central committee convention the former being a new organization and not yet possessing full confidence in its own strength had after resolving that the policy of emancipation ought to be inaugurated in maryland adjourned its meeting and reconvened also on the twenty third the rival conventions being now both in session a proposition was submitted by the union league convention that they should bring about harmony of action by joining in a call for a third convention to be held at a future day but there was too much difference in the underlying thought and purpose of each to permit such a fusion the union league convention had declared for emancipation the state central committee convention resolved that this convention ignores all issues local or national but those of war until treason shall succumb before an offended people it therefore declined the tendered overture and the union voters of maryland thus became separated into rival factions one of which was designated union men and the other unconditional union men both parties admitted the imminence of the slavery question but the former sought refuge in delay while the latter urged the policy of boldly grappling with and ending it the convention of the union men so far yielded to the drift of public sentiment as to pass a resolution declaring that the legislature at its next session should make provision for submitting to the people the question of the call for a constitutional convention while in an address which the state central committee issued on september eleventh though they deprecated the present agitation of the emancipation issue they said the immediate emancipationists must be unreasonable indeed if they desire a more rapid change than that which is now going on and has left the institution of slavery within our limits already scarcely worth the trouble of contending for on their part the unconditional union men answered by an address issued on september sixteenth disavowing all measures for the violent abrogation of slavery but asserting that the institution should be abolished legally and constitutionally at the earliest moment and retorting that since only the skeleton was left it ought to be removed pending this discussion of local policy by the voters of the state two important questions of military administration arose between the state authorities and the general government one grew out of the system of enlisting negro soldiers for the army which had begun in maryland as in other states and governor bradford wrote the president a long letter complaining that recruiting officers encouraged slaves to abscond and enlist and that owners were not only thus deprived of their labor but that they were in some instances refused access to them to identify their property for the mere purpose of formulating a claim to future indemnity 
after much discussion the president to some extent relieved this grievance by directing the secretary of war to issue a general order dated october three eighteen sixty three regulating enlistment of colored troops in the states of maryland missouri and tennessee and which was subsequently extended to delaware the order provided that persons so enlisted in the military service should forever thereafter be free that free persons and slaves with the written consent of their owners and slaves belonging to rebels might then be enlisted but if a sufficient number to meet the exigencies of the service were not obtained within thirty days enlistment might be made of slaves without requiring consent of their owners loyal owners were compensated whether they had given their consent or not upon filing deeds of manumission and release and a board was appointed to audit such claims this order gave satisfaction in many directions it helped to fill the army gave slaves an avenue to freedom aided and stimulated state emancipation compensated slave owners and lightened the burden of the draft upon white citizens the other question was more difficult of solution though the state of maryland had given continuous and conclusive proof of her dominant loyalty there was no disguising the presence within her limits of a very considerable minority of malignant secessionists who neglected no opportunity to propagate and practice treason and obstruct loyal administration major-general shank who had been placed in military command in maryland on december seventeenth eighteen sixty two found much of his time and vigilance required in ferreting out and repressing secret secession combinations or such open manifestations as evil doers ventured upon while disloyal combinations and plots were prevented by military precautions the secessionists lost no occasion to make a loud outcry and complaint of military oppression and in no particular did their wounded susceptibilities find so convenient a theme for energetic protest as in the charge of apprehended military interference at elections on october twenty sixth eighteen sixty three thomas swan chairman of the state central committee of the union men wrote a letter to the president stating that many union voters of maryland had a suspicion that the coming election on the fourth of november would be attended with undue interference on the part of persons claiming to represent the wishes of the government and asking the president's views on the subject to this mr lincoln replied on october twenty seventh as follows your letter a copy of which is on the other half of this sheet is received i trust there is no just ground for the suspicion you mention and i am somewhat mortified that there could be any doubt of my views upon the point of your inquiry i wish all loyal qualified voters in maryland and elsewhere to have the undisturbed privilege of voting at elections and neither my authority nor my name can be properly used to the contrary but the conservative party was disposed to magnify every pretext for complaint and would not rest satisfied with the general declarations the president had laid down in his answer four days later governor bradford wrote to him reporting rumors that detachments of soldiers are to be dispatched on monday next to several of the counties of the state with a view of being present at their polls on wednesday next the day of our state election and his apprehension that these military detachments if sent are expected to exert some control or influence in that election i am also informed continued the governor that orders are to be issued from this military department on monday presenting certain restrictions or qualifications in the right of suffrage of what precise character i am not apprised which the judges of election will be expected to observe it is unnecessary to quote in full the military order of general shank to which the governor alluded in substance it gave the following directions one that provost marshals and other military officers should arrest disloyal persons 
found at or hanging about or approaching any poll or place of election two that provost-marshals and military officers should support judges of election in requiring an oath of allegiance to the united states as the test of citizenship of any one whose vote may be challenged on the ground that he is not loyal three that provost-marshals and military officers should report judges of election refusing to require such an oath after an interview with general shank on the subject the president made the following reply to governor bradford in which the reciprocal rights and obligations of individual voters on the one hand and the government authorities on the other are set forth with that specific minuteness and clearness of analysis and definition which never failed him in this class of controversies yours of the thirty first ultimate was received yesterday about noon and since then i have been giving most earnest attention to the subject matter of it at my call general shank has attended and he assures me it is almost certain that violence will be used at some of the voting places on election day unless prevented by his provost guards he says that at some of those places union voters will not attend at all or run a ticket unless they have some assurance of protection this makes the missouri case of my action in regard to which you express your approval the remaining point of your letter is a protest against any person offering to vote being put to any test not found in the laws of maryland this brings us to a difference between missouri and maryland with the same reason in both states missouri has by law provided a test for the voter with reference to the present rebellion while maryland has not for example general trimble captured fighting us at gettysburg is without recanting his treason a legal voter by the laws of maryland even general shank's order admits him to vote if he recants upon oath i think that is cheap enough my order in missouri which you approve and general shank's order here reach precisely the same end each assures the right of voting to all loyal men and whether a man is loyal each allows that man to fix by his own oath your suggestion that nearly all the candidates are loyal i do not think quite meets the case in this struggle for the nation's life i cannot so confidently rely on those whose elections may have depended upon disloyal votes such men when elected may prove true but such votes are given them in the expectation that they will prove false nor do i think that to keep the peace at the polls and to prevent the persistently disloyal from voting constitutes just cause of offence to maryland i think she has her own example for it if i mistake not it is precisely what general dix did when your excellency was elected governor i revoke the first of the three propositions in general shank's general order number fifty three not that it is wrong in principle but because the military being of necessity exclusive judges as to who shall be arrested the provision is too liable to abuse for the revoked part i substitute the following that all provost-marshals and other military officers do prevent all disturbance and violence at or about the polls whether offered by such persons as above described or by any other person or persons whomsoever the other two propositions of the order i allow to stand general shank is fully determined and has my strict orders besides that all loyal men may vote and vote for whom they please before receiving the president's letter governor bradford had issued a proclamation stating his criticism of general shank's order and admonishing judges of election that their own judgment must determine the right to vote of any person offering himself for that purpose undeterred by any orders to provost marshals to report them to headquarters which he supplemented by a letter citing and acknowledging the revocation made by the president but expressing his regret that he could 
perceive no such change in the general principles of the order as to induce me to change the foregoing proclamation to this general shank retorted with a supplementary order repeating his directions to his provost guards to carry out his own and the president's instructions it was natural that such a war of words should ensue to relieve the irritated tempers of the governor and the general but it evidently had little effect except to confirm the adherence of each in the political views to which prior causes had brought them the governor and his friends may be pardoned for having continued to nurse and utter their unnecessary and ill-timed complaints for at the election which was held november four their party suffered a decisive defeat the conservative union candidate for comptroller received a vote of fifteen thousand nine hundred and eighty four the unconditional union or emancipation candidate thirty six thousand three hundred and sixty out of the five congressmen chosen four were unconditional unionists and of the legislature which was elected the emancipationists had a decided majority in the house and a practical majority in the senate the new legislature met at annapolis on january sixth eighteen sixty four and during the ensuing month amid the usual party and parliamentary strategy and debate upon collateral points perfected and passed a bill which provided for holding an election on april sixth eighteen sixty four submitting to the voters of maryland the question of convention or no convention and also providing for electing delegates to a state convention to amend the constitution mr lincoln followed with unabated interest the growth of liberal sentiment in maryland which promised to put an end to slavery giving it his constant personal encouragement on march seventeenth he wrote to mr cresswell one of the newly chosen members of congress it needs not to be a secret that i wish success to emancipation in maryland it would aid much to end the rebellion hence it is a matter of national consequence in which every national man may rightfully feel a deep interest i sincerely hope the friends of the measure will allow no minor considerations to divide and distract them as the election came on the usual controversy between secessionists and the military authorities about permission to become candidates and to vote was renewed but the correspondence on the subject between governor bradford and general lew wallace who had succeeded general shank was in better temper owing to the evident drift of public opinion and especially to the additional duties and powers which the convention act of the legislature imposed on judges of election when the popular vote was taken the question of emancipation gained another signal success there was a majority of more than twelve thousand in favor of holding the convention and of the delegates elected sixty-one were emancipationists and only thirty-five opposed accordingly the convention met at annapolis on april twenty seventh eighteen sixty four and its sessions were prolonged by animated debate until the sixth of september long before this however the main question which had called it into existence was decided the convention having on june twenty four by a vote of yeas fifty three nays twenty seven adopted an article declaring that hereafter in this state there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except in punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted and all persons held to service or labor as slaves are hereby declared free this vote of the convention in favor of abolishing the institution was so decisive that though the body remained in session more than two months longer no effort seems to have been made by the minority to reverse or rescind its action the constitution as a whole was adopted on september sixth eighteen sixty four fifty three to twenty five though thirty five of the delegates afterwards joined in a protest against it 
the new instrument thereupon went to the people at large and during the ensuing month was vigorously discussed in public by the strong parties which arrayed themselves for and against it the influence of president lincoln being invoked to aid in this popular contest he wrote the following letter to henry w hoffman on october ten two days before the vote was taken a convention of maryland has framed a new constitution for the state a public meeting is called for this evening at baltimore to aid in securing its ratification by the people and you ask a word from me for the occasion i presume the only feature of the instrument about which there is serious controversy is that which provides for the extinction of slavery it needs not to be a secret and i presume it is no secret that i wish success to this provision i desire it on every consideration i wish all men to be free i wish the material prosperity of the already free which i feel sure the extinction of slavery would bring i wish to see in process of disappearing that only thing which ever could bring this nation to civil war i attempt no argument argument upon the question is already exhausted by the abler better informed and more immediately interested sons of maryland herself i only add that i shall be gratified exceedingly if the good people of the state shall by their votes ratify the new constitution in accordance with the schedule adopted by the convention the popular vote for and against the new constitution was taken on october twelve and thirteen eighteen sixty four and proved one of the most closely contested elections held in maryland during the war rigid provisions had been adopted to prevent disloyal persons from voting and liberal provisions for taking the vote of maryland soldiers on the question at whatever camp or station they might be serving the result was a vote of thirty thousand one hundred and seventy four for and twenty nine thousand seven hundred and ninety nine against the new constitution though the majority of only three hundred and seventy five votes out of a total of nearly sixty thousand was a very narrow victory for emancipation the result seems to have been accepted by the defeated party without serious opposition a case was taken to the court of appeals on the question of the governor's discretion in ascertaining the result the object being to throw out the soldiers vote and thus defeat the constitution but the decision sustained the vote and on october twenty nine governor bradford issued his proclamation definitely announcing that the new constitution had been legally adopted and would go into effect on the first of november in accordance with this announcement the new constitution became operative and slavery ceased to exist in maryland however small was the majority by which the result was attained it was in entire harmony with the manifest popular will of the state for within the succeeding month occurred the presidential election of eighteen sixty four at which maryland cast forty thousand one hundred and fifty three votes for lincoln and thirty two thousand seven hundred and thirty nine for mcclellan giving the president who had prompted and aided state emancipation a popular majority of seven thousand four hundred and fourteen and electing a republican governor and three republican members of congress out of five and a new legislature with a majority of twenty two republicans on joint ballot the remarkable transformation of maryland by the war can be realized by recalling that at the presidential election of eighteen sixty only two thousand two hundred and ninety four ballots had been cast for lincoln the total then being less than one-third of his majority in eighteen sixty four chapter nineteen